announcements for her. Also make sure that you are putting up your syllabi in the back that Yase has provided. If you didn't do that yet, please make sure you do that before you go. Um, also uh, a big reminder, next week's Prout Chapel is actually in the Wolf Center. Okay, we have a very special guest, Desiree Cooper, that's going to be here, and that will be the Donnell Theater in the Wolf Center, which is the, the Titanic building that way on campus okay over by Kreischer and the fine arts building so make sure that you go there next week instead of coming here um there will be a, a sign up uh sign in sheet um outside the theater to get credit for that attendance um this is a premier campus event so it won't be just us there will probably be other people from around campus we'll also have some of her books for sale um next week which is really exciting um, a right, reminder also that if you have change of major and minor forms you can turn those in to me um, or to Jessica, just fine. Some of you have already done that, so that's great. Um, but if you need to, to locate me to do that, you can. Um, if you lost some headphones last week, they are in Danielle Birkin's office in East Hall. Um, so she's got them right there for you. Um, you'll need to bring your ID um, and be able to describe them to her in order to claim them. So you don't have any mysterious headphone cards. Um, let's see if there's anything else on the sheet that I need to make sure to tell you. Um, just want to put this up, a couple of things out there too, as far as arts events on campus. Um, on November 10th, 11th, and 12th will be Winter Wheat Writing Festival. It's the big free uh, writing workshop based festival here on campus. We will have our new faculty member, Rima Rajbanshi, reading. Um, Dr. R, for those of you that have her right now, she'll be reading on the Thursday night, so the regular kind of proud reading. Um, and then we have two of our alums coming back, uh, uh, Remy Rekia and Rosanna Alice Boswell Rekia. That's a lot of R's. I didn't really realize that until I started to put through the schedule. I like, wow, that, I didn't plan that, but that's fine, I guess. That's going to stumble me up. Um, but there will be free workshops on Friday and Saturday that you can attend and learn cool things and, and generate new work. Um, the always seeds of new work to carry you through the winter. Um, so that's coming up in November. We have lots more announcements about that. I also want to put a little seed in your heads about arts extravaganza. How many of you have been to an arts extravaganza here over in the Wolf Center and Fine Arts Center? Some of you are like, yes, arts, arts. Plan to go. It is a good time. So all the arts units on campus and other artists um, come together and perform and exhibit and do activities and so on. Um, we're working on uh, the theme of experiment this year. And that means that we're kind of looking at the intersection between different realms of art and other disciplines. 
um, the artist we're working on, I'm really hoping will come, is awesome. She does a lot with like biological renderings in artwork, um, and we'll we'll do some activities around that as well. So, if you are any type of artist, and of course you are as writers, but um, if you have other arts interests also, there will be a call for artists coming out probably next month, early next month. Um, so be watching your emails for that because I'll make sure that Danielle sends something out about that. It's going to be pretty exciting. And now I would like to bring to the stage um, Molly, who's going to introduce our first reader. Thanks a lot. Hi, my name is Molly. Um, for those who don't know, I graduated from the MFA program last semester. And I'm lucky to be able to introduce our reader, Yase Masengo, a second year fiction writer. Yase is one of my most trusted allies in writing and in life. Not only was he the sole inspiration for the title of my MFA thesis, but over the past year, he has become family to me. My personal admiration for him aside, anyone who spent more than two minutes with Yase knows he's one of the most dynamic, determined, stubborn, but also most passionate and well-read humans that you'll ever meet. His dedication to his writing is truly unparalleled, widely famous for saying things like, I can't hang out tonight, I'm thinking about my book. Yase's current novel in progress, which you'll hear a chapter from tonight, tells the story of the political repression and violence that took place in Cameroon in the 1960s. Clearly this project is a massive undertaking but with his nearly 20 years of military service, deeply held personal convictions and nuanced intercultural and linguistic knowledge, Yase is uniquely positioned to be up to the task. His work clearly reflects that as he has a special talent for conjuring vivid imagery, tender relationships and complex social and cultural dynamics in his work. Yase's work has been published in Brittle Paper, The Fitchburg Sentinel, The Hot Gen, Route 2 and Malarkey Books. He's multi-talented in all genres and a fellow writer I'm in awe of every single day. Also, it's his birthday on Saturday, so if you talk to him after this, make sure to wish him a happy early birthday. Please join me in welcoming Yase Masengo. How are you guys doing today? Alright, so I'm going to be, the first thing I'm going to read tonight is from uh, my book I'm working on. It's called The Matizar of Mount Kute. That's a working title. It can also be The Rebel of Mount Kute, but it's basically the same thing. And it took place in Cameroon in 1966. It's centered around a massacre that took place. So uh, let's do this. They would lift the singeing sun at its peak during the day and winged it to the coming harmattan at night. The Coupe Mountain above the Bakosi town of Tambo wanted more in December of 1965, so it called forth gray rolling clouds that crackled with thunder and let the sky tears and hail. The stony streets below became an empty muddiness because farmers feared their farms. Even though it was the beginning of the dry season, a time to prepare for the rains that started in May and ended in November. The tumble market that normally buzzed on Mondays with visiting traders became a theme of ghosts, and in the silence of its wooden market stalls was a memory of an industrious past that saw the sale of everything from kerosene and kettles to plantains and palm oils. The traders too were afraid. No one wanted their heads chopped off and impaled on the streets of Tumba. That's why Jungwe stood up every night in Mama Makuba's living room, training a pistol at the front door. It's also why the drums of war beat throughout the Bakosi land from Tongo to Wanuba, rising to the will of Wangu itself, that dreadful Bakosi Juju. Tungwa remembered the shriek that roared and rattled and was a wail too, a clamor of rock and rage. That was in August of 1962, after his graduation from St. Michael's High School in Boya. Back then, Bakosi students from all over Cameroon gathered in Tongo for the annual students' union week. Sons and daughters of the soil came from schools like St. Joseph's College, Sacred Baptist College, Our Lady of Lords, and from the universities in Suka, Ibadan, and Moscow. For seven days, they organized football matches, held debates, and danced morning. 
At night, they told traditional stories, sang by a huge bonfire, and met up at the Bois de Nuit. But some men chased the paradox of Monaco, the thing that is said to manifest as every man's dread. They became men if they caught it, if they dared to look in his eyes and touch his teeth, if they were able to reach into the mouth of fear. Because Tungwe had not found a Bakosi elder willing to be a mentor, he couldn't participate in this rite of passage. On the day of the chase when noon became night, men like him, as well as, well as women and children, locked their doors, hid under their beds, squeezed their eyes shut, their palm over their ears as Bakosi drums beat the dance of Mongol. They still felt the drums' vibrations, the raging whirlwind of the juju stampede, and the footfalls of the bull who did dare to chase. Ntungwa, though, would hear a wail because he uncovered his ears. That's how we heard the sound of curdled death. Every night for two weeks since the first beheadings, the wail came from inside his head. Most of the town folks knew the first three heads that turned up. Most of the town folks knew two of the first three heads that turned up on the streets of Tumbo that second day in December of 1965. The first belonged to Silas, a local drunk, also a tapper of the best men act a sweet palm wine noted for its potency. Because Silas was also known to sleep at the base of his palm trees waiting for the first drops offering inebriation, everyone was sure where to find him. Everyone knew where to find his body after seeing his impaled head by the Caracunas of Tumbo Market. Lazarus had Jagged's head surprised everyone because he was wanted by the authorities and had not been seen in the region since 1955. Back then, he drove passengers from Tumbo to multiple Bakasi villages and sometimes to loom in a rickety landover named Zengrad. One day he disappeared, and two weeks later, authorities from French and English territorial administrations came to his elder brother's house with questions. No one had any answers. Ten years after that, the case was the, was the same. No one in Tondo knew what Lazarus Ajan had been up to. No one except Ntungwe. Ntungwe also knew the third head belonged to Pierre and Joya. That's why he was a sentinel in his mother's living room with a pistol pointed at the front door, his grip sweaty in spite of the cold and the wet nights. The bush lamp on the coffee table next to him invited mosquitoes and moths with a wavering glow, and menacing shadows draped the walls of the living room and its pictures. Every time a cat had called, a stray dog howled, or feral cats meowed and growled on their night prowls, the shadows came closer and Jungwe squeezed the handle of his weapon. When he heard the occasional footsteps, he stopped breathing until they faded into the silence that preceded them. No one knew the weight of Ntungwe's secrets. They didn't know he spent some nights watching his mother's home from a foxhole covered with dead branches by day. Not his mother, Mama Makuba, not his brother, Ehade, not his best friend, or the woman he loved, Ekane, also known as Ekane that he loved. It was inconceivable to the Bakasi people that he, a son of Tombo, could have had a hand in the murder of Silas, an act they considered an attack on the tribe by Nakizar's fighting against the president's regime. That the tapper was also the father of Barnabas, a man with whom Tungwe had history, further complicated the matter. Lastly, Tungwe knew the tapper's death was just the beginning. Glinting Blaze hovered, Glinting Blaze hovered over his mother and the people he loved. Blaze hovered throughout the Tarkasi lands, and Tungwe had a hand in it because he'd sworn the stones over. Um, that's the first chapter of the book. I'm going to read a second story, and this is inspired, it's fiction, but it's inspired by, you know, the relationship my grandmother had with my brother, and also it's part of my relationship with him. So this is called Prophets and Revenants, and it's for my brother. Grandma ground my face into her clavicle with a tender, bony hug. It was the first time my brother Sonia and I were meeting her. This was in Douala, on the veranda of her pink concrete home surrounded by hibiscus hedges flanked by orange and lemon trees. The year was 1990. It is wonderful to meet you, Grandma said. Thank you, I replied, noticing what the pictures did. Her left eye was light sepia, her right eye a blinky slit of snow, and her face was royal. She looked like poor Amber. My parents, Sonne, and I had just arrived from Vitua. Our east to west trip had taken us across Cameroon, from lost tropical forest to humid Atlantic coast. While the 22 hour drive was fun for Sonne and I, the bad roads wore down my father and my mother hated every second. 
where we all looked forward to eating whatever was wafting from grandma's kitchen. We couldn't wait to bathe and sleep in soft beds to the wall of the necessary fan. Come and greet me, Grandma said, extending her hand to his son and hit between my father's leg, covering his face with my father's jacket. He was never shy, ever the one to introduce himself to strangers, do black, do backflips to the squirrels of little girls, and gesticulate at Roger Miller after scoring goals during soccer games. In my grandmother's presence, Sonia seemed to hide within himself. When Grandma finally saw his face, her face, her eyes widened, rolled in snow, and she became a raging shadow. How dare you bring that boy to this house? Grandma screamed and sprayed spittle, pointing at Sonia. Mama, don't do this, my father said. Don't do what, my grandmother hissed. Don't you see his face? Whose face, my mother asked. Sherry, what is she talking about? I too wanted to know what my grandmother meant, especially as she was glowering at my brother with clenched fist, and her left eye blinked faster than her right eye. A Y-shaped vein pulsed between her silver eyebrows. She thinks our son is my brother, my dad finally said. It was the most confusing answer I'd ever heard in my young life. Before I could consider its ramifications, my grandmother started reloading our luggage. A few kids stopped playing football to watch the old woman toss suitcases like pancakes. My father said his hand, my father put his hands on his waist and shook his head. My brother rubbed Sona's head and broke into laughter. Here is a key to the other house in Bonandale, Grandma said, handing my mother a key. It has been cleaned and I know you will find it welcome. Mama, I can't believe you don't want, you don't want to welcome your own son, your own grandson, my grandfather said. Then he got in the truck and started it. The neighborhood came out to witness familiar Buraha, but no one said anything because they knew my grandmother had four eyes. All of you are welcome as long as you do not come with that boy, my grandmother replied, standing in front of the main door of her home with crossed arms. Mama, you cannot be serious, my mother said. Suddenly, her laughter ceased. My daughter, I am as serious as the day I buried that boy 25 years ago, my grandmother said, pointing a shriveled finger at Sonia. And he knows it. Tears took an unfamiliar path down my brother's face, and I thought my grandmother was crazy. Sonia was named after my father's brother who died in the 60s, and he looked like his namesake. Old friends who stopped by welcomed us to the city of Makosa and Mamiwata swore my, my mother's son was my father's dead brother, especially when they noticed he was left-handed like his dead uncle. The family album seemed to confirm their obligations. Its pictures of decades ago made me believe someone had photoshopped my brother into a black and white side has some dull bottoms and big afros. But Sonia shared the same chin and ruthless jawline. I mean, sorry, both Sonia's shared the same chin and ruthless jawlines, and their lips were always between a snarl and surly laughter. My grandfather's ornamental nose hung under the same eyes of recalcitrant fire. My grandmother said, both so that were products of chaos. One day I refused to let your uncle go play football in the rain, Grandma told me two weeks later as she sat on her veranda and cracked the goosey while I packed logs of firewood against her outside kitchen. My father said it was one of my chores, but I had to go alone because she was intractable and believed every voice in her head. And, I asked, still angry at her for being a raging shadow towards my brother. He cried and laughed, he cried, he cried and I laughed at him, Grandma said. But then he said, I'll cry when the sun goes down. And did you cry, Grandma? Yes, I did. My Grandma said, lifting her right hand, a wrinkled paw with four and a half gnarly digits. Her index finger, smaller than her pinky, wriggled like a lava before Priscilla's. That was the day I sliced up my finger pulling pancakes. But anyone can have an accident, Grandma. Yes, but not everyone can promise their mother tears in the morning and die at night. That was the day he died. That was the day he died, Grandma said, on your father's back while he carried him to the hospital. And you think my brother is your son? I don't think so, Grandma said. I know so, and I know he's come to finish me off, that snake of a boy. I was sure my grandmother was crazy. <clears throat> Two months later, Sonia and I started school at the Presbyterian Primary School in Douala. In no time, he was scoring goals, doing backflips, and gesticulating like Roger Miller, that indomitable lion of Cameroon. Every day after school, we met with classmates in the neighborhood and played football on the sandy streets of Bonaparte. On one such day, our game was interrupted by a Tukuri shepherd and his herd of cows, a moving wall of muscle, hooves, and horn. One of the lead cows, a white, one-horned bull, 
bellowed like a drumbeat of fire, adding to the threatening cacophony of stumping hoofs. Sona and I and the kids we were playing with gathered by the side of the road, next to the small store that sold newspapers, candies, cigarettes, and condoms. Meanwhile, the two Korean men's heard shadow in our football field, and Sona stopped juggling because he started smiling. What is the matter with you, I asked, and our playmates stopped passing the ball between ourselves. The white cow is covering us over his head. It was typical of Sona to say cryptic things that confounded my father, my mother, and me. He woke up one morning and said, there is no God but I am hit, prompting my mother to dig through our Bible all day because she said it may be a little scripture beside her. My father just shared Sona's declaration to his friends while they drank palm wine. Your son is either a genius or the Antichrist, they laughed. We too started laughing when Sona said the white cow was coming. We stopped when we saw the one-horned white cow turn around with a violent toss of his head, pour the sandy streets of Bonaberry, and charge at us. The entire herd followed. We ran through the streets and the beast gave chase, creating tumult in their way. Children screamed, farmers threw themselves, farmers threw whatever they harvested in flight, taxi drivers honked, mothers cursed, and the crazed cows trampled as they went over people and pets and oranges and mangoes and plums that were on the roadside for sale. In the midst of it all, Sonia spoke in tongues and pumped his little arms and feet to the music of his laughter. He laughed as he ran while everyone was crying, panicking, and cursing the heavens. A few weeks after our bullfight encounter, we sat at Atkinoni's compound eating chocolate and watching the younger kids play and bump into everything and each other as they dance and chase balloons and grasshoppers and Antinomi's bell Rambo. Her chubby son Sango led the pack of goblin toddlers. My grandmother didn't come because she knew Sonia would be there. Sango will fly, Sonia announced, chewing on a piece of chicken as if his prediction was a particular taste. What does that even mean? I asked. But Sonia just looked up and smiled as if he'd seen an intimate secret with some, as if he shared an intimate secret with something unseen. There was a lot of food and drink as the children played. And some of the adults gossiped while others danced to Makosa, gyrating to the rhythmic frenzy of Duala music. Then everyone heard my hands scream, and when we turned, we saw Juan Nonne, the king of all birds, carrying Sone in his talons, gliding low across the length of the compound, and the toddler's dangling legs, and the toddler's dangling legs knocked down bottles of Fanta, Sprite, Hennessy, and Orangina, as well as trays of fried plantain, roasted chicken, and bases of crimson lilies. Rambo ran, launched himself through the air, and bit down on Sango's <coughs> pants, saving the toddler before the game became, before the bird gained altitude. So they smacked his thighs of laughter, and tears spilled from the fire in his eyes. That's when I first suspected my grandmother might not be crazy after all. I dreamt Grandma fell, so I said to me one morning as he darted out of bed and slipped into his shoes. And he dashed out of the room into the streets towards our grandmother's house, running like a one-horned white cow was after him. I followed because of his conviction and the need to mediate his presence with grandma. It was just beginning to get busy as I dodged people walking to work or waiting to take a taxi. The roadside stores were opening up, and the children had just started to trickle into the streets on their way to school, something Sonia and I should have been doing. I finally caught to Sonia just as he turned onto the small path that led to my grandmother's home, and I yelled for him to wait. It was so real, so I gasped. So real. The dream, you mean, I asked. Yes, the dream. What was it about? I dreamed Grandma fell, and it was so real. So real, I have to verify. I was about to tell him he had nothing to worry about, that it was just a dream, and that it was vivid and lucid because he cared deeply. I wanted to hug him the way my grandmother hugged me, grinding his cheek into my clavicle, so he'd know though a grandmother's love is beautiful, a brother's love is his own kind of serrated beauty a sword that is a shield that is of yielding loyalty. But before I could say anything, we heard Grandma. What were you trying to verify, Grandma asked? Haven't I told you never to come near me? I tried to tell her I was the one who wanted to verify that everything, I, I tried to tell her I was the one who wanted to verify that everything was okay, because I heard there was a blackout in our part of the neighborhood, but she told me to shut up. Then she reached to pick up a log to throw at Sonia, grabbing one that was a mamba's that was a mamba's roof. So then and I could only watch the gray blue serpent stand with the totality of his body, flare its hood, and sting our grandmother nine times. 
when it's slithered away through the hibiscus edges into the shadow of the own scene. Grandma felt Grandma fell before she could let out a scream, which was more of a whisper, because the venom was making her throat swell as she ran to her. She died in a puddle of soda's hot tears. I'm not sure my grandmother was crazy. Thank you. Alongside in this poetry canon. Um, he's an honorary girly member trio with me and Maddie. Um, and he always rocks the killer tote bag, loves the tea and the drama. I was going to say something about um, how he loves Smash, but he's kind of experiencing a main character identity crisis. He doesn't know who he is anymore with it. Pikachu, Roy. So if you play Smash when you're late, you have advice for him, give it to him after. He's ready. But his work asks you to sit and observe with them in their loneliness, witnesses together, help you to notice little details and moments in the world that most people would miss, like the changing of bikes outside of an apartment. His poems ask you to consider not just the rotisserie chicken, but the act of devouring, consumption, the removal of self. These poems bring a reader into intimate moments of connection, self-portraits that allow you to crawl inside and melt as well. But they also bring hope and comfort with lines like, I like to think there's a new sun every day. These poems help you discover the speaker on their journey of self-discovery, defining the warmth that was all was always there all along, but they were told they couldn't see. As a poem says best, here you are, the whole time, here you've been. Michael Beer. Michael. Um, I don't know what to say after that introduction, so I'm just going to go right into it. Um, yeah, that was lovely. Thank you, Megan. Um, I decided to start off with one of these self-portraits. Um, it's a newer one that I uh, wrote over the summer, and it has sort of like tongue twistery language, so please bear with me as I try to navigate. Self-portrait is stitching. Curious flashlit face pitched in for a thousand needles, needless to say, the turtleneck, threadbare, barely fashioned, how it hungers. Late night coffee stain, no light inside the closet, black hole to become hanger hangout. With or without, some days bring in the stream. Which walls cannot be seen by candle? Toward a star, upsurge of lonely tongue startup campaigns, degree of tang and red velvet mixture, pinnacle, touch starved and tasteless sapphire in the woods, turned ash and tornado, up and under between the wide sachet and the same old way. Get a grip. Speak nowadays and hold tight the void inside a fire pit. Smoke and rest, delay in embers, triptych sticks in the mud. Colloquial question, itch to scratch and cure, apply salve, tie ready prototype, and stitch who? This next one is titled Blue Poem, and it is after Lee Young Lee. I wait in a blue hour. A dusk blue light wraps the orchard like a blanket. Rows of blueberries hang like the sapphires in my grandmother's earrings, my calloused hands still indigo from last harvest. She was buried on a blue morning with those earrings, sapphire in life, nowhere in death but the blue shadow of a casket. I wait here, the birds sleeping, blue jeans tumbling in the dryer, 
and I wonder if those earrings are made with real sapphires. Around. Bones in stiff clay, an eclipse of moths escape, swath, coil, glimmer, fluttered wings of faint migration, openings in my skull, the reach of lamp light bends far and inseparable. Uh, another self-portrait, this is self-portrait is melting. Sometimes I melt in my own hands, like snow when the winter sun rises and warmth soaks through the curtains. I like to think there's a new sun every day. I keep less and less of myself this way, my body melting in my palms, skin dripping on the tile. The fridge buzzes as if there's something left worth saving. I think I'm a good person most days. The amount of good things I would choose to keep for myself is about a puddle's worth. I don't know how much that is exactly. And what about what a body unmade does to the heart? How the volume of unmaking never changes. The size of my own absence, only cupped hands could measure that. I have always wanted to be awake. I imagine your honeycomb lip balm lingering between the spaces of my words, my chipped sentences, my declarations of clarity, and I thought fragmentation of the self meant digestible, meant easy to handle, but staying with a sweet talker, I had to dissect your appetite for good marrow, your impatience with the discoloring of an unripened Polaroid. I chipped a plate trying to put it in the cupboard like an unfinished song. The distance between the palm and the forearm is the bridge you kissed the first night I made us chocolate cake my wrist. I cannot stop rub rubbing the blemish of your lips, a malted tattoo. I wonder when I pull out the poem I wrote to you and recite its final words, I too blur if they come to fruition, if they chisel away this marble image of you until nothing. Walking to the bathroom with a sore throat. The cough drops melted into the wrappings again. They looked lovely, forgotten, in the sun-glazed windowsill. Not that they were ruined, but that, seeing them soften with a sunken readiness, they became more believable. One last smoke with you before I move across the country. We lie at the foot of Berry Hill while we sink into the soft earth, city lights doze off in the distance. Everything follows our quiet. You pull a blue lighter, you pull out a blue lighter and place it in my palm with a pair of cigarettes, still warm from the roots of your pocket. Flame pushed. An infant light fidgets and lies still, sleeping in the soft blanket of my curved hand, heat kissing our chins. We breathe the anatomy of flame, spindled smoke usurping our words, glowing cliffs inches from our noses. The stars look beautiful tonight. I take a deep breath and keep it, just a moment, holding in my lungs the unspoken weight of leaving. Self-portrait is coughing. The sky drops through my mouth and you're lifting me. Rooms, molasses, and without doorways. Lift me from my throat. Dark hallway in your hands and pull hard against the thick, syrupy walls. You are eucalyptus nailed to its own tree. The sweet dirt. There are rooms without doorways, forced air between them. I'm afraid. Lift me from my throat. Your hands need to be dark hallways so I can feel my way through. Circulation stops in me all the time. 
Pressure starts in the lungs and ends in the calm, forced air. Each lung is a slow, rippling room, and I slip through the dark. You lift me. I need the risk of sky on my tongue, hands inside my chest. What is there to remember but the old ways of breathing? Third funeral. In one day, a tree can lose all its leaves, like the night my mother cried to me about another death in the family. Inextinguishable winds blow onwards outside the funeral home where I saw my first dead body, someone who once knew me. The satin-lined afternoon smothers dry earth. Wind-fallen leaves sink faithfully toward unsettled dust. No wonder we insist on better places. The branch that broke under. The branch that broke under your weight knew more than anyone. That enormous plunge to a less forgiving earth, and you began to clutch for something that could hold you again. We were boys who imagined we belonged to the times belonging to us. The world raised us in its frenzied cobweb, snatched leaves right out of the wind they danced in. And while I never remembered the morning you moved away, I hated how the wind looked for you in the trees, their deep cello branches. Our choices fell separate through the years, with no place to land except ourselves, how we are found by what looks for us what is known and what is past knowing, stopping where it begins like love, a love unstranded, had we pulled the ground close to our knees, arms outstretched. We might have been ready then. Where things belong. A loose door in the center of an empty room telephone cords below the sink, a writing desk under a pedestrian bridge, a shower curtain in the backyard where the grass's edge and the fence gate meet, two large cups of coffee bonding at a bar, stickers anywhere, a clay angel dreading its turn in the kiln, clouds so low you want to believe the sky is connecting with you by saying, here I am, the whole time, here I am. The small hand of a grandfather clock clinging to the long hand. A handful of flowers before it becomes a handful of flowers. Music everywhere. A sudden letter from an early love getting lost in the mail. The last page of any book replaced with its first page. A dirt path formed over time between perpendicular sidewalks. A glass heart beating inside an ornamental chest. My body reliving itself through poetry as if to say, here you are, the whole time, here you've been. Self-portrait is freezing. I love the silvery tail of a water droplet, I think. Icicles suspended from the gutter, the unadorned calls of blue jay. I have been told more than once that I lack density, the tightness of solitude, a bolted door behind my eyes. I pile up all the things that make me knowable and they freeze into a spike of ice. It hangs off the gutter of my loneliness, a permafrost of fears. In the cold of myself, I am unspoken for. Tell me, this isn't who I am. The roots you swear by. You bring me inside the greenhouse where you spend hours cultivating yourself. You measure that my heart takes one cactus to fill, and I insist it's more like two if we don't count the roots, and you say, always count the roots. An orchid brushes against my wrist, and I flinch. Stump shoulders, dry fingers not conditioned for such intimacy, rich intimacy. I watch you miss the ferns, the way our soft breaths manifest in the cold, attentive, tender, 
these methods and unspoken cycle of keeping. Please don't ask me to take the cactus home because then I will grow to witness what these two hands can nourish, press thumbs into spines, prove that cactus and heart are not so different when it comes to where we put our love. Reparting our shapes. The algae blooms beneath a bowing sun. Threaded from the lake, a calm breeze skims my shoulder. I hear the birds, a small angle in the sky, soaring across the horizon's middle glow. And I feel the dead wood in the crooks of my knees, rough with and without time, the touch of grained memory. I wonder why you left yourself on something rotted, your name still etched in the middle post you thought would fall into the water. We sit together at the edge of the dock that stretches far from the lakefront, as if it were an arm guiding us to the center of the space only our bodies once filled. Tell me, where can I find the rest of myself? This dock, a walkway into a place your absence has eroded. The whole lake is a balancing act of grief. And suddenly I'm not here anymore, visiting the lake that holds you in its paw. I'm back to the city that helped me find where other parts of me remain. But there, at the dock, I know. My heart is the moment the post finally falls, the midpoint between the water and your name. Bones we learn to live without. We migrate to the forest, searching for what it means to be scavenged. There is no forest. I am standing alone in my kitchen, picking clean the leftover rotisserie, tossing bones to the corner of my paper plate, meat gone cold. I breathe alongside the silence, like a vulture who circles too many times before landing. I am no vulture, according to my mother, who lives tired and alone. She aches of sciatica. She aches of reassurance, saying I must leave and forage a life with my own hands. My father, lying in a strange bed, infection eating away his hip, he prays for what is left of him to return from the nursing home. Home is a place I don't know anymore. Hundreds of miles from Tennessee, missing the comfortable laughs as a child, the board games we played after dinner, I am all of one now. Every wall between us echoes a sun-sized hollowness, a spent family barely living, a phone call every weekend, a split from bone. These next two are a little shorter ones. Um, First one is titled, Untitled. A shadow scratches at my feet. It pleads, what is my name? What is my name? What is my name? And so we are tethered. Bedroom window. After the storm unwinds in summer air, the outline of morning cradles you. Pink petals press against glass like forgiveness. Let the good, good world pull you in. This next one is probably the longest poem, so two short ones and then the long one. Um, it's called Taking the Gap. Expectation is a thing you build a house around and let it get swallowed by long splashes of ivy. You let it. It doesn't take much because expectation happens as you glance at the bike rack outside your apartment in the alley. The bikes change every so often and you know they change because there's always someone unlocking to leave or locking to stay. But this time, you see the blue door of your childhood home instead. It swings open, and the bodies of strangers are in the living room laughing. 
The grass outside is shorter than it used to be. Birdhouse 2 is bare, but Birdhouse 1 is still seeded. It's chilly. Autumn leaves are in medium yellow. That place isn't as empty as the way you left it, as it left you. What is a place that leaves? You know people leaving and people staying means there are places worth going. Black birds perch on a thin wire fence and call to each other with sparing eyes. Ivy stretches along a brick, reaching up toward a rippling sky. Summer bears its cheek to the city where wind begins. Shadows sing to the alley walls, overfilled dumpsters rot. Yes, you are here, standing at the bike rack, waiting for something to overtake you, something you can call a way through. No, a way with, a bringing. What is a place that follows? Body deep in brick and concrete, new wind, the want to bring this place whole, the people you love, letting this place become a part of you. But you don't know how. You have never known how. It all feels far. It all feels far. They're not the same, distance between and distance apart. One clings to the edge of a rain cloud. The other hollows canyons through the eyes. What is there to explain? Appeasement tastes like the five days my father spent violently tumbling in the gray flood looking for us, my mother and me, in a dream he had. He woke dressed in sweat and found we were not really gone from him, our bodies dry in sleep. I thought I lost you both, he said. I didn't know what to do. Of course, I heard all this from my mother's mouth weeks later when I was starting to learn the importance of movement. How circumnavigation is a language of appeasing, a rope that strings together all the words that never left the cold of my tongue. I frayed its edges with my teeth. Language was never meant for my father when he summoned thunderstorms in the living room and left us with the rain and lightning. I had to know my way around the floor plan of his temperament, uneven at best, what he let me see, an outline, wall made of masking tape. Now I am 23, and my mouth tastes like my father lying passed out in an endless sheet of water. His face, worn and wet, looks as if he wants to speak, lips parted like dust. This is how dreams can be unmoving. Stillness of him, dark room, the taste knocking at my teeth. Self-portrait is juicing. I try to follow the squeeze of a lemon. The spill down into glass, snaps of sunrise too sour for any sky. A mosaic of lemons sprawls on the counter, leisure grown into their rinds. I try to imagine every lemon happy enough, like an orchard of self, like how sour is an idea that depends on whether my body knows my body, like the seeds of my identity. My tongue, my heart, my hand wrapped around lemon. Feel the way it demands belief. See how the juice rivers my bottom wrist. The act of this tightened fist is a motion toward discovery, a way of knowing why I am. Uh, this next one is titled Philae, and a Philae is um, an ancient Greek bowl um, primarily used for like, libations to the gods. Finally, shape my body into a bowl and drink from the shallow collarbone I leave for you. Waiting in the wine sky, the half moon rediscovers us, the doctrine of our bodies. We lie here, offering the world nothing but ourselves. The way your cheek presses medallions in my chest aches. Your breath flowers. A mouth is a measure of faith 
is a curl between skins, is the knife that belongs only inches from our lips, is enough. Don't wait until morning for renewal when the bed is made and light turns everything too certain. Think of the gestures that make us endless. Speak if you can. Tell me how prayer is too small for this. After a burial. I pulled a man out of the ground by his hair. He had grown suddenly, deep and unfurled, in the bed of marigolds. I sprayed his body clean with a garden hose, light shower, the water clinging to every open part of him. To know someone is to keep them living. I brought him inside, away from the reach of August heat, found old clothes that needed another body to hold on to. I offered breakfast, two eggs and a mass of grits, but nothing. He only wanted to eat handfuls of marigold seeds. I watched his skin turn a bright orange after. Five days since he arrived, and now the walls of his chest emit a glow, small room of light, clouds in his eyes. He doesn't speak, only sits at the kitchen table during the day, echoed star. We sleep in the same bed, eat all our meals together. Sometimes he follows me out to the garden just to sink his hands in the warm dirt for hours, breathing marigold, a way to give in. I'm starting to love this man. I'm starting to weep in orange petals. Spilling too. When autumn determines the geography of our footsteps, we will be wrapped in new longing, having forgiven, or sorry, having given the earth our worries to take around the soft of its waist, and tonight will fade among the moon spilling. The evening sky kneels into night, on and outside our skin. Long quest of starlight, pine scent, the forethoughts of rain. Your fingertips, raspberry stained and wanting, they mend new memory, film and lightning. Field crickets needle the air between our shoulders. The lattice of a sliced raspberry, wild and sweet, fair as a heart, we sew ourselves open. We reach inside the soil of ourselves, looking for what makes us necessary, and we both come out with arms full of raspberry blossoms. Proximity. We beg for the red spruces to tell us where our hearts end, as if knowing would mark us further, blue stripe of a mallard's wing, the river's widening banks. We bear our stomachs to the sky, chewing on the last good day of dried mango, because what else can we do when the air feels restless on our skin, stretches of wet moss? Our bodies are the maps we come back to, thick slabs of our tongues, ground spit. The mosquitoes carry our blood to new reaches, how we move still. To think we have all of ourselves is absurd evening sun in our eyes. The whole forest blinks as we fold into nightfall. Uh, this is my final poem. Um, and before I get into it, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, it was really a pleasure to be for all of you. Um, this last poem I wrote um, for my grandmother. And writing about family is something that I want to do. Um, and this is uh, a step towards that. A golden shovel for my grandmother after Rita Dove. It takes a bundle of apricots to climb death. Straight from the branch, sliced into small pieces and stored away for a lifetime. Dying is a kind of fermentation. A jar of death waiting in a pantry, sour and breathless. This is how I see you live. What is any of this life for? The whole sky is already busy with a lullaby. You listen to the clouds while everyone gathers blossoms to chill, tiny frosts of remembrance. 
The earth tightens its nightly lid so that no body escapes to brush the calling stars. I want to ask how it feels to be within a body that betrays you, pink thistle and bone. We polish the stone so that one day it might reflect back the sky. I should have visited you last winter. What is there to have in this life? The cancer ceased for now, but I can tell that you hate to admit how such a good thing makes you ache. So you wait for the indifferent hand to unseal your apricot spirit, caught between the spine of memory and mourning. What is a thing left unsaid, lost and a part of us, our trees silent in flower? Thank you. Yeah. 